All right, today on the buy round, we are joined by one of the most intimidating players to have ever played the game of rugby league. Um, he put the fear of God into the opposition. I remember um, playing against you actually for the very first time. I think when you came back and you played for Bradford and um, I was a very naive 19-year-old and, oh God, um, yeah, that, that was not fun. Um, <clears throat> but we'll get into all that a little bit later on. But thank you, Adrian Morley, the one and only, for joining us here on the buy round. My pleasure, Jammer. Yeah, it's good to be here, pal. Yeah, uh, just before we start, is uh, is there anything you want to uh, add to the agenda? <laughs> Any other business? Uh, no, I'm all right, but I know... Uh, I know you love your office, so uh, there'll be a few office quotes, I'm sure. Mm. Did, did you get the facts I sent? <laughs> <laughs> Put in the waste paper, didn't you? <laughs> Don't be any really facts, is there? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, I, I, get, I don't know if you ever remember this, Moz. I, I spoke briefly about the first time I played against you. But we'd met on a tour in 2004. And the tour was... I, I was captain of the England Academy team. You were over playing your trade at the Roosters. Um, but as a teenager, I was given a quote by you from an interview that you did about defence. And I can remember, it's one of those strange things that sticks in your mind. You get the quote, and I, I, I've had it on my bedroom wall, <clears throat> and you said, um, defence is... It was a quote about defence. It's commitment and attitude purely. You've got to be willing to maintain the rage for 80 minutes. Right. And I can remember you said, I, I remember that quote. I don't even didn't even need to write it down, but I was like, that stayed with me. And that was part of that, I guess, that tour's mission statement, if you like, was like, we're going to try and maintain the rage. Right, for 80 right. minutes and it came off the back of you oh, right. um so yeah and then obviously <clears throat> for 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 a boy to have that well I was just a boy a teenage boy to have that on his wall and then to be sitting in uh, your apartment in could you bay having a, a beer with you yeah. is it's it's a it's a bizarre experience it's, it's an experience that most people don't have so yeah. um yeah thank you no, I, that. I, 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 the first time I've heard that story, and it's, it's nice to have, uh, you know, inspired, you know, uh, the young generation in a way. And I think that was the first time Great Britain had gone down and, and got some some form of uh, success against the Aussies. So uh, it was great and great to see you guys over there. But no, it's nice. Uh, <clears throat> it's nice having that little uh, tale told. I, I didn't know that, Gemma. So uh, all good. Yeah, we. Um... We had a couple of beers in, in Kudji. It didn't <laughs> quite go to plan that evening. Um, <clears throat> carnage ensued. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We were, yeah, well, a bunch of, what, 25, 18-year-olds, and we, <clears throat> yeah, got to let loose in Sydney, and yeah, we, was, had, uh, we had you it was, chaperoning us. Yeah, I'd love to say it was... Uh, a great experience. It was still a great experience for some of the lads, but it was, uh, you know, probably wasn't as professional as we as we should have been. But, uh, but um, yeah, I guess something to talk about. Yeah, the, the, can't, the, we can't tell the full story. No, though, no, <laughs> probably not. But uh, yeah, the, these things happen. Um, before we get into um, your amazing career, what's the, what's the Adrian Morley up to now? We had a, a brief chat. Um, before we came on, but what what are you actually up to now? Because I think a, a lot of people just, especially for our listeners in Australia, they just assume that you're, um, you know, I involved in the game in some capacity over here. Uh, no, I'm not, and um, I'm quite happy about that. I still love the sport dearly, uh, but uh, I stayed involved for a couple of years after I finished playing. I played I had a 20 year career, so uh, it was it was weren't just you know uh, a short career. So I started, stayed involved, uh, sort of on the commercial side, and, and and I tried a year at coaching at Leeds, but none of the roles really floated my boat. You know, didn't really uh, get the same enjoyment as a player as you do as a coach. Which I, I knew that was going to be the case, but I just thought there'd be uh, some form of of bridge there. But didn't enjoy it, and I've got three young kids, and I just found it was having a big impact on my family, you know, my weekends and my summer holidays, Easter holidays, etc. And I said to my wife, "I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna come out of the game." And uh, she said, "You know, I'll support you." And um, 
so I've been involved in recruitment for uh, the last uh, four or five years and I knew it was the right decision straight away, you know, um, just, just as I say, getting my weekends back and having having that flexibility and freedom to, to do what I want and, and run my own race, really. I still do bits of media stuff with with, uh, with Rugby League and, um, you know, uh, do stuff when I can, but quite happy just to dip my toe in and, um, and, and and leave it for the rest of the time. When when you say recruitment, we're not talking about, <clears throat> like, the, the recruitment of players. It's... <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's construction, yeah, constru- yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... Uh, it's uh, that's that's my main job. I do a, I do a couple of little jobs as uh, like a brand ambassador for a, for a couple of companies as well. So it's a very varied week. You know, it's not just one thing. So there's always something going on. And as I've mentioned, I do bits of uh, bits of media stuff. So uh, uh, I'm on the panel for the for the Man of Steel, which uh, you won that, didn't you, Jammer? Uh, one year so again it's uh, just a little bit of involvement it's not every week so every two or three weeks I watch a game and and give my view on the uh, the man of the match you know the, the first second and third man of the match so again enjoy that involvement without being uh, so time consuming yeah so you get your, your little bit of a, a, a rugby fix but but it's not that yeah you know, yeah it's not full time incumbent yeah, exactly and consuming role yeah. within within the game that I guess we stresses a lot of people out so you you obviously value that that work-life balance you're willing to work hard but you know I suppose do you take your work home with you no not really I mean uh, at your level maybe (laughs) (laughs) is that a game in the office Uh, no don't get me wrong uh, you know you're always working you know when you're out and you you see someone who, who could benefit you in uh, in the work scene. You know, you you, you have a chat, you, you you exchange cards, but it's not like rugby league where, uh, as a player, you know, you always went home thinking about it, thinking about the next game, thinking about the month ahead. As a coach, even more so. Whereas uh, it's not like that in the uh, in the civvy world. <laughs> in the real world. In the real world, that's right. Yeah. So, the, I guess what. It, what I'm looking at is, is do you miss that though? Because there is, I guess, when we're, when we're playing, I kind of felt felt attracted to the, the madness of it all, you know, you, and like that life on the edge of you know not knowing what the outcomes are going to be. Yeah, obviously you're in recruitment and there's there's challenges to that, but it's it's nowhere near the same. And you know, we were saying part of me would 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 love to be a coach, but then again, it's it's pretty scary who who you might turn into. You, I guess. I've said it before. I've been the madman. I don't need to be that anymore. Are you? Yeah, in a similar boat as that. Yeah, I'm, I'm. You know, don't get me wrong. I loved, absolutely loved every minute of of me of my playing career. I don't think there's any role in rugby league that would replicate playing. So that's why you know I've took a step back and um, you know when, when you do finish, you, you do take a couple of years to adjust and acclimatize to the, to the real world. But I know you know there's no job in the world that would. Uh, I'd get as much as enjoyment as as I would as a professional rugby league player, and I've come to come to terms with that, and I accepted that. So uh, you know, there's a few roles in in rugby league that would be appealing, uh, but um, you know, I'm quite happy with my decision. When I would, when I am in and around the uh, the team environment, it's great. You know, you get that buzz again, and you know, there's just the the banter and the and the piss taking and all that what goes with it. It's uh, fantastic. But you know, I had my time. I had probably as long a career as anyone else I know so you know uh, I had it it was great but time to move on yeah. you, you spoke about that a couple of years to, to get over it and, and processing it did you find retirement difficult at first because like you say it's 20 year career and yeah easy to say well I had it all and I, I won a competition in both on both sides of the world but you, and you, you wouldn't swap that you wouldn't roll the dice on that career but you, you again it's difficult to explain that to the viewers that yeah you you brilliant career but then you, it's difficult to come out of that isn't it, it yeah it's very difficult I mean there'll be a void in my life now probably till the day I die you know them, them 20 years were, were fantastic however because I did play for that long I, I really was ready to retire Jammer you know my body was failing me really you know my performances weren't the same as they were and you know, thirty-eight year old. You know, to play majority of your career in the second row, front row. Uh, I'd, I'd I'd got everything I could out of the out of the career. So and I, I knew it was ready. So I think if people retire early through injury or you know just not good enough, I think that would have a more of an effect. But because I played 
as long as I could. Uh, I, I was I was really happy to, to retire. But then there's the the, the void in terms of uh, the camaraderie, the banter, the, the, the team spirit, and when that's took out of your life, it's um, you know it's a bit of a shock to the system. But because I stayed involved for a couple of years when I did finish playing, I think that sort of uh, uh, steadied the ship for a while, and then. You know, after a couple of years, that's when I come out of the sport totally. So I did sort of do, do it gradually. But as I say, I, I do still miss playing, and I, I miss the uh, the banter, I miss the uh, the camaraderie, I miss I miss the confrontation. Uh, even though it's a brutal sport, and you know, you saw for a couple of days after I, I miss the uh, you know the the feeling just for just for a game and your heart's going right, right. Come on, it's having me or you. I do miss miss that, but you know, it's something uh, as the years go by, you get more and more used to it and. You know, it's just uh, just just part of uh, evolution of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess it, it it is. It takes a certain type of person to actually to say that they miss that that confrontation. How how do you get that that sort of fix? Is it just mentally just knowing that that that's what's done is done, or, or yeah, do you do just you, you look in in pretty good nick? Just yeah, still I, train. I still train most days, Gemma. Um, but fit body, uh, fit mind. <laughs> <laughs> fit body, fit mind. But yeah, I still, I still train most day. But uh, you know, I, I, there's very few sports in the world where you get that. Come on, it's me or you, and it's uh, it was great, you know, getting that fixed. But you know, off the field, and you know, I'm quite a mild, uh, mild mannered guy. Uh, but then, because you you have to be a, a lunatic for uh, for 80 minutes once a week, it, it was great. You could get it all eight system and then <laughs> go back to being uh, the, the the normal guy. But but instead of you know, having the the confrontation and the and the physical stuff, uh, I, I try to do challenges now. Uh, you know, a lot of it for uh, for for our mate Rob Burrow, and I'm doing a marathon next year. But um, we did uh, a bike ride from um, uh, Niagara Falls down to New York City. It was 550 days over 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 six days. So when you have a goal like that, you you you, know, you can't just go in there and, and just do it. You, you need to train for it. So little things like that keep you going. Nothing will ever replicate playing. Uh, but you know when when you when you do get a bit older, you know having little goals like that does does really help. So we're doing uh, as I say, I'm doing the uh, the Leeds Marathon next year for Rob Burrow. We're also doing a cross France uh, bike ride for our Rugby League Cares. We're going from the Atlantic to uh, to Pepignon. Um, I think over six days, so uh, wow. yeah, so it should be a uh, should be a good challenge. It's 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 crazy that isn't it? Because you, you you're doing it for a great cause, but it actually helps you as well. It does. It yeah, really. Yeah. I, I you know I know my my ta my mindset when I was an athlete was like, oh, when I finish playing, I'm never going to train ever again. This is it's a means to an end, right? And flogging yourself, yeah, like it, it it's hard. Like I. I guess I, I enjoyed the training and trying to get the best out of myself, but it was, it was I was doing it yeah. basically because I needed to, I, probably the ego of getting embarrassed on the field made me want to train hard because I, I didn't want to embarrass myself on a, on a training pitch. But then the point of getting former athletes to do these type of challenges is so much benefit from actually having something to aim for and all, not just the physical side of it but the mental side of it as well yeah. and, and also yeah. like i i've not done anything like you but i did a half marathon but the commitment to run on a sunday uh, on a saturday morning meant the decisions i made on a friday night were so much better due yeah. to the fact that i'm, I'm not going to let you down moss because yeah. i'm going to be there running with you yeah yeah no to totally agree with you and that you know we was away for 10 days but it was a bit like being on tour there was a few ex pros there was Paul Wood, uh, Nathan McAvoy and Keith Senior but it was great you know uh, there, were, there was a couple of girls who did it but it was mainly 20 lads away you know uh, working hard and having a few beers at night and it was absolutely fantastic but but because we trained for it and we did it it was quite emotional when we finished in Central Park it was it was really uh, you know there was a few few tears yeah. there and uh, yeah, it was lovely re really nice but but you, as you say it's it's great for the uh, ex-pros to have something to, to train for or a goal and get it done and uh, you know get it smacked yeah I think any f former professional athlete out there should should really look at that as you know a lot of people I know like self-medicate um, and, and look at exercises like oh, I've, I've done that like I'm over it but there's so many benefits and and you know you look at you could look at something like a, 
a marathon or, or some of the challenges that you do but you don't need to be that di- like that degree of difficulty you can just start small and, and build yeah. up to that yeah of course you can yeah i did a walk as well uh uh i walked from S- salford stadium to headingley stadium 48 miles again for rob burrows and uh but you know you can't just do that walk you have to train for it but it was in lockdown actually so you know we weren't working nothing to do and i just thought right but i was going out for three and four hour walks and re- really enjoying just a bit of time with myself and then when I did it, I said, I don't just want to walk it, I want to do it in under 12 hours. And I did it, but but again, that's something to I trained for and did it and sense of achievement after it, it was uh, it was great, really, really enjoyed it. And uh, But yeah, so there's the, um, the the Leeds Marathon's been dormant for uh, about 20 years. They're bringing it back next year and they're renaming it the, the Rob Burrow uh, Leeds Marathon. So a few of the uh, ex-players have all put their hands up, so I thought I can't let... Uh, can't let our rub down, so yeah. uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna train for that and uh, get that one done. Yeah, nice, nice, good on you. Um, <clears throat> okay, we're gonna go back to the decision to go out to Australia. You came through you at at Leeds. Uh, you're making a big name for yourself over here at the Leeds Rhinos. Um, probably wasn't really an in vogue. Not not that it ever has been, but. I think at the time when you went to the Roosters, you'd have been the only English player in the competition over there. Not many players had done it for a long time. There was a stage there where some of those players, when there was um, the competitions, didn't align. Yeah, yeah. They would go over and play, um, you know, for a yeah. bit of a, yeah. extra quid. But then you, you, you were the one that really went. I, I, I'm going, but. I'm interested to hear about your, your thought process in, in the build up to that and what was behind that decision. Well, I got coached at Leeds. I, I love my time at Leeds, and if it wasn't for the opportunity to go to Australia, I dare say I would have been at Leeds for my full career. You know, they, they really did look after you, and uh, it was my first club, and I absolutely loved the place. And uh, now we got coached by uh, Graham Murray for, for two of them uh, years I was there, 98 and 99. And, um, I had a great time under Graham Murray. I thought he was a fantastic coach, fantastic guy. Under Muzzy, we made the inaugural grand final in 98 and then we made the uh, Challenge Cup final, winning that in, in 99. Now, he, he went to the Sydney Roosters. Um, oh, no, he'd not, he'd not, he'd not signed. He, was, he went back to, to Australia. Now, I toured uh, <clears throat> Australia with Great Britain in 99. We played the Aussies up in Brisbane. We got a good hiding, actually, but I, I played all right. And uh, the great Arthur Beatson come up to me uh, in the players' bar with Nick Politis, who's the uh, the godfather of the Sydney Roosters. And and uh, Arthur said, uh, I thought you played well, but I want to talk to you about coming out and playing in the uh, the NRL for the Sydney Roosters. But I didn't think anything of it at the time. But then a few weeks later, Graham Murray, uh, I think I think he went back to coach Northern Eagles or but or Norse, but the deal fell through. Anyway, he got the head coaching role there at the Roosters. And that's when uh, I thought, you know, uh, that they're interested and Graham Murray's there. If he ever did go to Aussie, you know, uh, I'd want to chat with them. But I, I knew, talking to the Aussie guys and watching it on TV, you knew the NRL was a uh, much tougher competition than, than Super League. So, um, you know, being, being a young uh, English forward, I wanted to, to, to try my luck and, you know, see if I could handle the, the NRL. So I had another year on my Leeds deal. So in 2000... Um, I was chatting to uh, with the Roosters and I, I made the decision uh, to, to sign for him. But I did get offered more money to stay in the UK, actually, off, off Leeds and Wigan. But uh, as I say, I wanted to go for the challenge drive. And don't get me wrong, I still got paid and I got pay, paid well. But uh, as, a, as a monetary decision, um, you know, I would have earned more money to, to stay in the UK. But made the decision and um, as you say there was, there was there was no English players out there since the season started running concurrent in in 96 um, you know players Aussies and English players used to as you, as you say two or three months they could go and guest abroad and but there, there was there was there was not no uh, English lads over there so uh, but it was um, it was great don't get me wrong very very exciting you know living I never lived there uh, anywhere else apart from Salford and to, to go to the other side of the world it was fantastic and uh, the, the first year was there uh, didn't go as well as I would have liked I broke my arm uh, halfway through the year and then um, Graham Murray got the sack uh, who, who signed me 
And then I was thinking, you know, where, where does that leave me? Um, so I come back to the UK and Leeds, Gary Edlington was on the phone. He said, look, we know you've not had a great year, but we'd like to have you back at Leeds. So it was good that I had something to fall back on, really. But I thought, you know, I don't think the Aussie public or, you know, I, personally, I didn't feel I put, put my best foot forward and play my best uh, rugby league. So I thought, no, I want to go back out there. And uh, Ricky Stewart for me. He said, look, I can assure you in my plans, Adrian, we want you back uh, in Sydney. And then uh, went back the following year and that's when, I sort of got used to living away from home. I got used to, you know, the way my teammates played. I got used to the heat, which, uh, as you probably know, is a bit of a bit of a factor. And uh, the second year it just went great. So that's how the, the the opportunity come about. And then, you know, I probably did uh, probably another three years on my own. I think the last year I was there, uh, Brian kind of come out. So I at least had a uh, one of the British teammates, even though he was up in Newcastle. I didn't didn't catch up with him a great deal. And then I think the following year, um, Gaz Ellis come out. And then, uh, what year did you go out, Jabba? Uh, 2011. Oh, right, okay. And obviously so, Sam had gone before right. that as well. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So and then, you know, they slowly started coming through. And then, uh, obviously, the, the, the salary cap increased in in, um, in Australia. Uh, so it was certainly more more uh, uh, more more lucrative. And it was also uh, very exciting. I mean... Uh, it's probably five or six years too late for me to, uh, to but, but I mean, it, it should be the telecap. cap. I think it stayed the same in, in the UK for 20 years and, or, or something like that. Whereas, um, you know, in Australia, it increased and increased and uh, quite rightly so. So uh, it's great that, you know, all the, all the English lads are going over there and, you know, virtually every one of them has gone out, has done, done really well, been, been, been very proud of him. But I think it has strengthened the, uh, the national side. And, um, you know, if I can add, if any young British lads any advice, I'd say go and try a look in the NRL. It'll improve as a player. You'll have a, you'll have a great experience, a great time, and uh, there's not much uh, not to like about the place. I admire that about you, Moz, that you made that decision to go, and it wasn't all about the bunts. Bunts and burner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice little air against the. <laughs> um, but how, how much did it weigh on your mind? Because the e the easy option is there's more money here in Leeds. <clears throat> I'm at a successful club. Do do I really need to go over there? And again, it it, it, it there's there's admiration for you to yeah you obviously yeah there's, there's pros but um you know, <clears throat> one of the big decision or one of the major factors of of any British player going over there now it is the fact that it is more lucrative in terms of. You, you know the dollar yeah. um, that you can get, um, and you know not, you know the, obviously the, there's current the you know the currency that, that it used to be in terms of the exchange rate, yeah, but yeah. Um, you know it's not just about chasing the Aussie dollar. It's for, for you. It was you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go and yeah. test myself and <clears throat> and and the pressure that comes with that. Did you feel there was a target on your back because you were the only palm in the competition at the time. Yeah, I did. I mean, <coughs> uh, you know, my, my, my thought process, when I made the decision, I was uh, 22. Um, but I just thought, if I don't go now, I might not get another opportunity. And then I just thought, you know, uh, why not? I had been to Australia with, with Great Britain uh, once or twice, and I just thought, it would be a great place to live and would be a great place to to, to ply your trade. So you know that that was a thinking, but I was you know still still a young man really. Uh, but when I did get to Australia, I didn't realise how big the sport was until um, so I flew into other Sydney airport and there was three camera crews there. And I just thought, well, what are these guys doing here? Anyhow, they come running over. Will you give us a, an interview? And uh, embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> The, uh, <laughs> light reading in here, <laughs> but, but uh, no, I did the interviews, and then uh, the first week I was there, it was probably did twenty interviews either on the phone or in person. I'm just thinking, wow, this is uh, this is another level. This I weren't used to the uh, the publicity and the and the um, and the, all the razzmatazz that went with it. But because I was because there was no English players out there, you know, couldn't uh, Great Britain players. There was a big big target and a big big news and. Uh, 
but then the pressure started mounting then think you got to perform and um th that first year th there was a couple of games i was i was pleased with i got I got man of the match in a, in, a, in a couple of games but just as a whole you know that the, when i broke my arm on uh on ruben wiki's head uh, that, that didn't help uh anything but then there was a suspension suspension here and there believe it or not as well jammer <laughs> so uh it was just a very uh stop start season yeah. and uh it was quite frustrating um because of that uh but you know after the second year it went went really well but yeah i remember um you know there being a bit of a target and it used to get all the you pommy bastard and all this mm. and uh but you know uh, you, you do get sledges and you you probably it brings it but i think it it for me that that bit of a target of being english well, it, it, it helped me yeah 100 percent. And, and again it helped me train harder because i didn't want to embarrass myself yeah 100 percent. and you know I, I felt i was um representing the yeah. Super League and England and Great Britain and, and all that, so it did did really help. And then, uh, but when you start giving them a bit back, you know, the, the, all the uh, comments stop. Then don't they jammer mm, in? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, th you know, when you talk about that and that, that experience of all, all those interviews, you know, people can look at it and be like, oh, whatever, and 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 look at it as a negative. I look at it as a, a real positive thing because I think that's where our game deserves to be yeah it deserves to be you know dominating the back pages and if a player messes up the, the front page pages like like it is with football, football. Yeah, soccer. you know for the aussie listeners yeah. so oh, you said it not me <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, you know th that's where our game should be in yeah. my opinion because yeah. because of you know the quality of the product yeah i totally agree with you yeah i mean uh, i i really enjoyed it i mean it, although it was daunting at first and um you know that you know that when i first got over there was they got over my uh disciplinary record in the uk and one of these reporters had printed my disciplinary record which wasn't great believe it or not and then uh <laughs> but then i'm thinking wow i've not even played a game yet and they're trying to you know regard me as a, a dirty player which I wasn't was a jammer and then, and then uh, so <laughs> so then um, but but that that's the type of uh, you know any public is uh, just love a story don't they mm. so, uh, so but yeah I just thought it was uh, another level but it as a daunting as it was I sort of come to appreciate and enjoy as you say uh, that the our sport you know, rugby league the sport of love is uh, is the dominant uh, sport especially in Sydney anyway yeah Speaking about getting to Sydney, you went to the Sydney Roosters, the, the glamour club of the eastern suburbs, uh, very far removed from where you grew up at Salford. How did it, how did you fit in there um, culturally with the you know <clears throat> for in one of the most exclusive areas of you know one of the most expensive cities in the world because you know there was lots of characters within that group as well yeah um, so you've got this glitz glamour club with some great characters i think freddie uh fletcher was there um luke ricketson chris chris flannery tells a story about you that um <clears throat> he used to say m m used to wear those um he didn't three, quite <laughs> three quarter lens. the three quarters <laughs> the three quarter lens but yeah. he didn't quite know if they were short longs or long shorts they were like <laughs> so you've rocked yeah. up in your three quarters <laughs> yeah. got bouncing down bondi <laughs> and they're all yeah. they're questioning your, your fashion yeah. um so just how was that culturally you coming from salford into onto you know the, the swanky streets of bondi oh, it, it, was, it was fantastic for me it was like uh like being on holiday, uh, you know, I had a beach at the end of me, end of me street, and uh, you know, really did have to have to pinch myself a few times, saying, "Wow, I'm I'm living in uh, a holiday resort, basically." But then, you have to sort of. Uh, I went to the beach every day for about two weeks, and then the, the novelty wore off, really, and then I didn't really didn't really bother with the beach. It was only when me me my family come over. But you have to think like this is just because I live in a beautiful place. You know, you, you've still got a job to do, and it's the the, the real world. But I loved it. I mean, rugby league lads. You know, in England, you do you do get there is a bit of a down south. There's a bit of a class divide, but you don't you don't get that in, in Australia really. And and rugby league lads are rugby league lads anywhere. You know, anywhere around the world. So there was never any uh, uh, you know people living in a, just because they're living in a nice house or an affluent area. You know, they sort of got a sense of entitlement. Nothing like that. So the lads were lads were just great from from day one. But I just loved loved the fact that you know it was 
sunny every day. There was a beach at the end of the road, and it was uh, this is where I, I now called home, and you know uh, this is where I work. So loved it. Yeah, um, the the heat was a bit of a factor because you know when I got there, it was um, January, which is the hottest hottest time of the year in in Sydney, and uh, the boys had just done uh, all the international boys got till uh, till till the new year off. Uh, we started back the first week in Jan, but the lads had done like a six week block before before uh, Christmas and they were all flying and there I was I'd had a big Christmas and a big lot of lot of farewell do's in England and I was probably a bit out of shape but these lads were flying and in the heat and I just thought wow I might have bit off more than I can chew here but I did finally catch up with them but it was uh it was tough for a while but uh but but loved it I mean they did uh they did train harder than um than the boys in the UK um you know uh I think it's the length of the pre-season there because the, the the competition over here would, would start the first weekend of Feb. So, you, like you say, <clears throat> you go back in January, you got two weeks to train hard in the freezing cold, and yeah, then, then you're playing, you're playing yeah, a friendly, yeah. and then you, you, you're back into yeah. you know week to week mode. Pretty, pretty much, uh, but also the uh, the time of year we, we train in the UK it was middle of winter, miserable, yeah. and whereas you know beautiful conditions there in in, in Australia and. Because their season is short, so they did have a longer pre-season. But I, I used to pride myself on my fitness. That was uh, one of my strengths at, at Leeds. I was one of the fittest, certainly the fittest forward and one of the fittest in the club. Whereas when I got to uh, Australia, even when I caught up to him fitness-wise, there was there was four or five lads, very, very fit lads. There was uh, Luke Rickardson, Craig Fitzgibbon, Simon Bonetta, and these were just like, uh, like machines. And uh, they, they helped me, really. You know, they got me... Even even fitter than than I was uh, in the UK, which which was great. So I think um, um, I think they, they were fitter in general, but the, the conditions uh, did did really help. Yeah. Spoke about some of the the players within that team, and um, just how special was that group? Obviously, you went on to win a, a premiership there, but it was a a team that was full of characters. It was. Um, it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it was it, it was brilliant. I mean, um, we had a. 20 year reunion from the uh, the grand final winning team this year actually and it was fantastic to see some of them guys again and uh, it's amazing you know not seeing some for, for nearly 20 years and you just go straight back into mate mode piss taking mode and it was just absolutely absolutely brilliant and uh, you know do it now when when we have reunions at Leeds or Warrington it's just uh, you just have that bond and that uh, you know uh, that that camaraderie, and if you have won something, it, which is great, you've got that bond for life. Then you know, uh, but yeah, there were some characters, Brian Fletcher, who's uh, you know, he's just he's just like a, a kid who never grew up, and uh, he's <laughs> he's just doing now and uh, doing very well on TV in Australia. But he, he was always the character of, of the team. Uh, you know, uh, there was always, never a dull moment when uh, Fletcher was around. Is it from well? I would... I don't know. Should I ask about the stories from when you were playing together, or the stories from the twenty reunion? What would be, uh... <laughs> it was a bit tamer uh, twenty years uh, later on, but but yeah, some some of the stories were were, were uh, you know brilliant. You know, uh, you know end of season trips, that kind of thing. It was uh, it was great. You know, you can't really uh, elaborate yeah. <laughs> elaborate too much. But there, there was you know I thought when I went to the NRL, it'll be. Uh, a lot more professional, you know, in terms of drinking and that kind of thing. But the Aussies were worse than the the, the English, really. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, we all like a drink after a win and that kind of thing. But the uh, they just took it to, to another level. The uh, <laughs> the Aussie boys and uh, and it's just, I remember we had a, I think we finished a block of uh, two or three weeks and so it was encouraged by the club, you know, the the coaching staff. Yeah, go out and have a have a drink. You deserve it. And it was just like. It was just carnage, and I just said, "Is it like this every time you go out?" And they said, "No, no, this is a tame night." I thought, "All right, it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be a good club this to play yeah. for." <laughs> yeah, I think it, it, it's good that that, you know, because we are just knockabout lads, and yeah, there is a, a level of professionalism, but you know, when you have a a good win or a solid hit out, you know, we're men of extreme, um, we rip in on the training field and push ourselves to, you know to the absolute edge, but then, you know, I think when you look at a job description, people like yourself, your job description is to, you know, st stop 120 kilo men running at you and you got to run into them. You're not wired up correctly. No, no, and, you, <laughs> you know, you, the, part of that coming together, 
the bond is is created through having a good time together, and that's I've I've always found that the closer the team, or, you know, if you can come together and bond with each other, and some of that is away from the training field, and it does involve alcohol, the the better you tend to perform because you you're more than workmates, you're more than teammates, you're yeah. actually you you your friends and a lot of them friends for life. Yeah, no, hundred percent, and uh, I know you know now um rugby league clubs and, and the game in general really just try to shy away from the, the the drinking culture but it's a massive part of it you know in, in my opinion um don't get me wrong there's lads who didn't drink you know who, who, uh, who were teetotal they, they'd come out and they'd still have a great time and you can still get close to someone when other people are drinking and, and you're not you don't have to be uh the drunkest man in the room but it is a it is a, a massive part in my opinion uh i remember we was going through a bad time in 2002 and uh, we'd lost a few games and then Ricky Stewart took us to, to Manly. Uh, he just thought we needed a good a good drink and a good uh, a good session. Anyhow, we had a fantastic night, fantastic drink and we didn't lose a game since the end. We won the last nine games straight. And I'm not saying it was because we had a drink, but it, it certainly did help. But I'd, uh, I'd just missed, uh, I'd just had a back operation, which was... Uh, quite serious could have uh, finished my career I'd missed nine weeks of the season and then I'd, I'd just come back just finding my fitness and then uh, Ricky took us uh, to Manly and then the last ferry was going and I said I'll get it and I ran and I ran to the uh, to the ferry and I jumped and I made it but as I landed my ankle I went over on my ankle so then Ricky uh, Ricky got to the next pub in in um, in Sydney at Circular Quay and uh, my ice, my uh, ankle was on ice in this pub and he said, what have you done? I said, oh, I jumped. I said, he said, how am I going to go and tell Nick Politis now that you've just missed nine weeks with a back injury and I've took you on the piss and you've gone over on your ankle. So, uh, but he did anyway, but then I, I only missed a week, but then joined the guys again and then, uh, as I say, we, we didn't, didn't lose a game then till, uh, till, till the end of the year. Yeah, how oh, good. That, that grand final must have meant the absolute world to you. Oh, it, it was great because I'd had, you know, uh, even that year, you know, um, I'd, I'd, I popped my rib in the in the third game of the season. I missed four weeks, and then about four weeks later, I'm just getting this niggling back pain and pins and needles in my legs. Nothing, no treatment would would touch it. And, I, and um, they said the last resort is surgery. Now they said um, there's a 90% chance it'd work, and it's called a laminectomy where they trim the vertebrae up to free the uh, to free the nerve, uh, there's a nine percent chance some uh, nine percent chance it won't work. You'll have pain for the rest of your life. And I said, I'm no uh, mathematician, but that's only ninety nine percent. And he said, uh, Well, there's a one percent chance you'll lose the use of your legs and uh, you'll be in a wheelchair. I said, uh, All right, but he said, no, no one's ever lost the legs on my watch. So uh, anyway, uh, the surgery went great, uh, but but for being in uh, very up and down. You know, I say the second year went really well. It was, it was, uh, it was challenging. It was, um, worked a great year until the end, and then, uh, but, but then, as I said, I missed that one with my ankle. But then I, I played in the last uh, eight games. Well, I missed one with suspension, but that's a different story. But then, but then to to, to finish the season like that was a massive relief. And you know, um, the Roosters have not won the comp for twenty seven years. And to be part of that team, I felt really uh, after that win, I accepted then off, uh, off, off the press, you know, even my teammates, and um, you getting that win, it, it ticked the box. I thought, right, um, you know, I've made me made me mark now. Yeah, well, you certainly, you you left a mark over there, and you know, you you still have a a huge reputation on Australian shores. You're still spoken about in in the public, and um, you know, if you ever see a, an aggressive style of player. They're often referred to as very Adrian Morley-like, um, which I think is testament to just how you uh, applied yourself. Um, there was th there's rumours that you used to have a little black book. <laughs> is this where you something may happen and you you just mark someone's name down? <laughs> yeah. So and, and you, you go after them. Can you just explain to our viewers about the yeah the, the, the Adrian Morley's uh, infamous black book? Yeah. So we played. So we won the comp in 2002. 2003, we were flying. Um, that that gave us confidence then. And we was we was belting everyone. And um, particular forwards, we had uh, great line speed and we were whacking everyone. And um, it was uh, Joel Clinton, I think, from uh, Penrith Panthers. He, he written a bit in the paper. It was just 
normal stuff. We're we're not scared of the roosters, you know. Where we'll fight fire with fire with FOs, blah blah blah. And uh, anyway, I walked in the changing rooms and uh, someone said, "Have you seen what Joel?" Could? I said, "Don't worry, I've seen it. It's in the book." <laughs> anyway, uh, that game, I, you know, got got over on him. Uh, you know, give him a a bit of um, a bit of attention, battered him all, all game. Anyway. Got to the the following week, we got got into the uh, changing rooms. And Ricky Stewart flew over to me. His nose was about that far from my face. He went, "Who's in the book this week, Moz?" I went, "All right." I just looked down at their forwards. Just picked a forward at random. Yep, he's in the book. Anyway, that 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 day he got the uh, he got the attention that day. But then that was it. Then every week it was. Uh, I would put someone in the book myself, or one of my teammates would say, "He's a, he's an idiot. Can you put him in your book?" And then, uh, <laughs> but it got to the point where. You know, there's six or seven teams in Sydney, and um, whenever you go out around the town centre, you more than likely bump into someone from an opposing team, and you're always a bit like, you know, a bit guarded because you don't want to give any seat. Anyway, after about 20 minutes having a beer, this uh, opposing forward said, "You're not going to put me in your book, are you?" Man? So I just thought news has news has got round, but uh, but it, it was great for me. Uh, it was a bit of fun amongst the lads, but it gave me. Uh, a goal as well, you know, someone to to, to really go at, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a bit of fun, but uh, it was it was just something that uh, helped me. Yeah, in terms of that that reputation, um, I think you know the one thing that um, springs to mind is is the the, the test match at, at DW um, against Robbie Cairns, obviously an Ashes series, and <clears throat> you know. I, I can appreciate the the hype, the build up, the, the importance of the start and setting the tone. Yeah. Um, can you talk with, to us a little bit about the build up to that, um, and, and what your thoughts and recollections are yeah. on that on that moment? Of course. Well, that year, I'd, I'd probably had my, 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 my finest year as a player. I'd uh, just played in a grand final. Uh, I just got the the player of the year at the the star studded uh, Roosters. And that year, the black book was getting used uh, left, right, and centre. But but that year, I was I was on top of my game. I just felt like the the the, the baddest, hardest forward on the planet. You know, uh, you know, uh, possible and probable kangaroos. There was having it, and I just thought, I'm going to show my British teammates how to handle these Aussies. You know, where uh, you know they're not supermen, and uh, I've been I've been you know doing the business all year. Uh, but but that year, uh, that 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 game, sorry. Um, uh, the game got delayed for for uh, traffic getting to the ground, so I was I was really was fired up, uh, you know, when it when uh, kick off come round, and then I just wanted to put the biggest shot on I've ever put on, and just uh, as I say, uh, show the show me my teammates how to handle him, and then uh, at the very last minute, Robbie Kern sidestepped and uh, put the arm out, and then uh, I, I don't think. Steve Ganton seen it really, but then he seen it on the big screen. He said, uh, "It's a bad run that you, you you've got to go, Moz." But uh, but yeah, it was just a case of getting a bit too fired up uh, before the game, and uh, I did feel uh, if he'd have put it on report and let us play on, that would have been uh, a fairer decision. <laughs> but uh, looking at it on uh, on the video, it wasn't a great challenge. So that was me my, my mindset really. But but we nearly beat him as well. We were beating him all game. If we'd have won the game. One for half was bad about getting sent off, but uh, you know we was winning with five minutes to go, and then they uh, they managed to get us in the end. But uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty heartbreaking uh, at the time. Uh, but yeah, it was just uh, just one one of them uh, moments of madness, really. What what I've taken out of that is uh, you're blaming the traffic, for, <laughs> so. and the referee. Yeah, if it, if it would have been. Uh, and also, do you think Steve Ganson would have sent the Aussie off at that stage, Jammer? That bottle is get I don't, I don't, no I don't, way. I don't think um, he would have. <laughs> you, you know what? I've watched that moment back in, in preparation for, for, for this interview. And you know what springs to mind? No one runs in. All oh, right, okay, right, right. Right. Like, you, you think, I, I think <clears throat> that happens to you. Someone's running in. Right, okay. Do you know right, what I mean? Like, right, if, you, yeah. if you watch it back, <laughs> right, like, yeah. You, you see him go down, yeah. and they all kind of just go, oh, <laughs> oh it, it was him. Oh, go on, yeah, you, yeah. You, you know, but now, now an incident like that happens, there's lots of pushing oh, and shoving. Yeah. But even back then, it was probably more inclined to, to people to come in and start throwing them. Yeah, yeah. There was, but I think with your reputation, oh, everyone's seen it was you and just gone, 
fuck that. Right, oh mate, I've never never thought of that. Mate, to be fair, it was, uh, right. Will, will you think about it? If it, if it happened, if England play Australia and it's, you know, a, a Luke Thompson or, or a Victor Radley, and and he and he goes up against you know, Big Tino or or whoever it may be, or or, or we come up against the Kiwis and it's Jared Weir Hargreaves and he's, you can't tell me that someone's not going to fly in. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. It, for me the. The striking thing is the the lack of response. Right, right, yeah. And I've say never never noticed that really, but uh, yeah, I think it speaks volumes, mate. <clears throat> anyway, coming back to to, to Australia um, and the the person from Manchester. Do you, and I talk about the the effect that Sydney can have on you. Um, did, did it change you much at all? Or do you think you stay true to? To, to who you you wear basically what i'm trying to ask is did, did you still wear the the three quarters <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah yes i wore them for the best part of six years Gemma. <laughs> so uh yeah but the, the beauty of it for for my situation was uh the all the test series were in the uk at the end of the year so i'd come home and then play the play the test in the uk but then i'd have my six weeks break in the uk so i'd have like three months in the uk you know get to have christmas with the family so even though I was there six years in Australia, it wasn't six years straight, it was just nine months, three months at home. So I got my fix of uh, everyone in the UK. That's why my accent very rarely changed when I uh, when I went, went to Australia. So I'd like to think I, uh, I stayed true to my three quarter length shorts and my, <laughs> and, my, uh, and, my, and my English accent. But I was getting the best of both worlds really, you know, getting my fix of uh, friends and family back home and then going back out to uh, to work and live in a, in a great country. Yeah, and then <clears throat> just in, in terms of that, decision to come back um you know, wh wh why why did you why did you you leave um you know you we had, you had a you had great life over there i remember speaking to you um about and think i think i recall you saying that the plan was to was to go back obviously you settled here in in england now but what what was behind the so, decision to, to to leave australian shores and, and return well it was just the fact that me me my wife fell pregnant with our, with our first child, so uh, I just thought it'd be great to have the family around to, to help us at that uh, special time. And uh, Warrington offered us a four-year deal, which is a bit of security. I was uh, 29, so I just thought, you know, of the of the uh, of the baby in the UK, uh, see out the four years, and that'll probably do me in terms of playing. And then we did have plans to go back to Australia once the the uh, the contract had, had run out but so that was, that was my thought process to go but i was really happy at the roosters and uh but it was probably the security and the uh and the fact that we, we was going to have a baby but then at the end of the four years signed another two years and then signed another year at warrington then signed for salford for another two years so the career just kept going on and on and then in that time we had another two kids so we had three kids and then uh you mentioned before the, the the exchange rate in 2008 or 2009 it was the financial meltdown and then it probably wasn't as uh, appealing to go back because you know we just lost if we was taking english pounds over we just lost a third of our money so so we just decided to stay and we've still been there you know ever since but don't don't break me out to live in the uk you know it's a fantastic yeah. uh, place to live where where we are and um, you know when we do visit australia we do say you know what could have been and, and that kind of thing but you know life's too short to really uh dwell on uh decisions you didn't make yeah um <clears throat> reflecting on your career are there any regret at all um is there a, a, anything uh, you'd want to well, change or yeah obviously that <laughs> the first minute of that test match in 2003 i'd, I'd, I'd change that but no i mean as i say i'm, I'm quite uh you know there's a few uh Sendings off, not just that one, but a few others that I was uh, a bit uh, a bit ashamed of. Really, uh, my, my last game uh, for the Roosters uh, ended in uh, a send off. I got a seven game ban for um, for kneeing an opponent in the in the head, and that was the majority of my sendings off and suspensions have been high tackles and careless high tackles. Whereas this was uh, a bit bit dirty. Really, I didn't regard myself as a dirty player, even though me. me uh, my judiciary record would suggest otherwise. Uh, and, and in the UK, another time I um, headbutted uh, Paul Rowley, who's the current uh, solver coach. But little things like that, you know, uh, 
dirty play really you know i didn't like other people doing that so um i didn't see why i should be uh allowed to get away with that so just just a couple of little things but in in general um you know the game is a brutal game and uh, you know if you if you mentioned it's quite an extreme sport played by extreme people and the people who play close to the edge sometimes do boil over and um, and go a little bit the other way so uh, but no no um, uh, if you if you live your life regretting things yeah. and all that it's uh, no no it's everything that's happened has happened and I've, uh, I've I've enjoyed every minute of it just flipping that what are you most proud of representing uh, Great Britain um, or England as it were um, you know won Challenge Cups Grand Finals but for me uh, representing uh, Great Britain or England is the is the pinnacle of, of my career without a doubt. So I was fortunate to do it uh, for a long time and, and many times. But uh, it's pretty special when you're lining up with the, the best players from from uh, from your land singing the national anthem. It's uh, pretty hard to beat. It is, isn't it? Yeah. It, again, one of those things that, that stay with you. It's something I remember you saying. <clears throat> I'll never retire from England. I'll always be available. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I'm probably not in the right shape, but if I get the call up, I'll, right, yeah. I'll come and represent. Yeah, yeah, that's. Um, I don't think you ever retired from the international game. You, no, you're no. Sti you technically. So you're still Sean active. Wayne, I'm still available <laughs> if it's needed. But uh, but no, that that's what it meant to us, uh, you know. And just them, um, you know, three or four weeks when you're in camp with uh, with with, uh, with the boys and uh, brilliant, you know, particularly when you're touring. But just uh, just just unbelievable. It's. Uh, Certainly, my my fondest memories of of uh, playing the sport. Yeah, we. It's interesting that you you say you have some some great times over with some of the Aussie lads, but that English being English English humour, that getting back into camp, just yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty cool, isn't oh, it? Oh no, it's, uh, it's it's unbelievable, and uh, I, I popped in to see Sean Wayne actually, and uh, just being in and around them in that environment brought back so many uh, great memories. It was uh, great. Yeah. It really is. Talking about regrets in the, the the international team in the international game, one of the the biggest regrets I have <clears throat> is um, getting that 2008 World Cup wrong. I think, you know, we speak to people and we reflect that was a incredibly, I think it was one of the most talented, most able squads. Yeah. Squads. I mean, we did. We didn't get it right, and I was only probably twenty three at the time, but messed up there. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. It was, uh, you know, the, from the year before, we had a great test series win against the, yeah. uh, the New Zealand, and uh, you know, I was extremely confident, and uh, yeah, for just didn't uh, think I was quite a plan, did it, pal? No, it didn't. And you got to, <clears throat> you know, I'd, yeah. Don't want to be too critical of the, the the coach at the time, but I think you know again twenty three and you know perhaps as leaders we could have handled that been better, but I don't think he set the right environment for going over there and and getting us to win. Right, uh, okay, but that's just my opinion. Um, what are your thoughts on the on the on the international game at at the, at the present moment? Well, it's been. I've really enjoyed the World Cup. It's been. I think it's been fantastic. I think uh, BBC and and, and uh, the people over in the UK have done a great job in in terms of uh, uh, publicising it and getting it out there. And uh, I think BBC is massive. Um, you know, Sky Sports do a great job for the Super League, but to get international rugby league on domestic television is is fantastic. I don't, I don't know what the you know the money they're paying, but it's. Uh, it's great, great for the sport, and uh, as I say, the more people see our fantastic product, the, the better. Um, and I think England have done great. You know, uh, it could have been a banana skin the um, uh, the Samoan game, but uh, they, they really did school the Samoans. But I think it's been uh, fantastic. The game's only going to get better and more competitive. But I've been uh, really, really pleased with uh, how it's gone. Yeah, yeah, me, me too. And I think that after that Samoan game, I think. It really started to make you believe. Yeah, like, def definitely. I mean, uh, you know, the, the way uh, the way the boys are going, they're going about the business, and uh, the, the, that, that's the word belief, and uh, they the believe in each other, and uh, 
anything can happen. They just need to get to uh, Old Trafford, which uh, you know is very much in their hands. And then, you know, let, let's face it, they're going to play either Australia or New Zealand in the yep. uh, in the final. Anything can happen over 80 minutes, and with uh, 70,000 screaming uh, Englishmen uh, in, in the stadium, and anything can happen. So, uh, but it's been it's been great. It's been uh, you know the, the uh, been really pleased with the the uh, Aussie based players. The, yeah. the backs have been uh, been fantastic. Yeah, they, they they have. I think that that's they've really you know shined in this tournament. Where usually typically it's the you know, the English forwards that make make the name and, yeah. and the the ones to watch. But it's really pleasing to see the outside backs. You know. Yeah. shine and take centre stage and, yeah. and, the, and the focus be on them because the, the forward pack will just rip in and do their job but, yeah you know the, the forwards will get them there but the backs have got to got to finish it off as always yeah i, I like victor radley as well he's yeah. uh he's my little fave <laughs> he's he, he came on our podcast oh um, did he right but after he announced that he was going to play for england and right just something in his eye. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got, oh, just one of those, he's got, he's got the look yeah, on yeah, 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 he's got that. And like the way the way he talks about, like, yeah, obviously just that confrontation that, you know, just want, wanting to be hurt and yeah, hurt yeah, people. Yeah, and you're yeah, like, yeah, Jesus brilliant. Christ, like that. <laughs> yeah. to this. I'm, glad I'm on this side of it now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, Moss, just always wanted to ask you this. What, what club do you associate yourself with? Um... But, Probably, it's a good question. Um, in Australia, the Roosters, because I only played yeah. for them. But whereas over here, I had a few clubs. Look, I'm a Salford lad, and um, I've been a Salford fan since I can, I can remember really. So I support Salford, but but. <laughs> Told you not to mention Salford. <laughs> well, Mos, we've just been there. Uh... Slightly interrupted there um, yeah. from the, the fire drill, but important, never use the elevator, even <laughs> no. in a drill. <laughs> no. No, you can, no. What's this? It's probably not worth it, is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the team you resonate with the most? Yeah, well, born in Salford, Salford raised, so Salford supporter, and, uh, you know, I'm still a Salford fan, but... Uh, out of all the clubs I played for, I probably feel more affiliated with Warrington, really, because uh, I spent the most time there and played the most games for them, and uh, you know we had a bit of success. So uh, uh, Salford and Warrington, they're, they're my teams. Yeah. Um, looking at the future of our sport over in this country, um, where can we get to? Obviously, the IMG team are coming in. Yeah. Where where does it need to be fixed in your opinion obviously you've spent time over there in australia you you know what works what doesn't over there you, you've seen it here and like you say you spoke earlier about um you know players pretty much being paid the same as what they were 20 years yeah, ago so yeah yeah well it's it goes hand in hand i mean uh, australia they've got the luxury of these big tv deals and it's just a, a much bigger sport so i think getting getting more people participating playing playing the game will, will certainly help also, uh, getting the game on as much domestic uh, TV as we can, you know, the BBC can help in that regard. And then as a knock-on from that, you know, it's the best product in the world. You know, I'm, I'm very biased, but I, I'm not anti any other sport, but I watch other sports and I watch rugby league and I just think it's, uh, you know, it's absolutely absolutely fantastic. So uh, the more people we, we can expose to, to, to rugby league, the bigger it will become. And, um, you know, and that, that deal with, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the big... Um, IMG is it? Yeah, uh, yeah. That that could be uh, could be fantastic. It could be a uh, it's a massive publicity machine, and uh, you know, uh, take a leaf out of the NRL's book. They 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 they've got it right down there. But uh, I think it's uh, as I say, it's a numbers game, and then uh, hopefully, um, you know, we can start the uh, the ball rolling in the UK and uh, get the sport up to where we think it should be. Yeah, brilliant. Well, on that, Moz, I'll uh, I'll leave you to it. I know you're a busy man. Um, I know you're. You're not quite the the boss of your, your company, but you assistant are assistant to the boss. You're assistant, <laughs> <laughs> assistant to, <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you keep your head down, <laughs> who knows? You've been hot seat. So, <laughs> now, Moz, it's been uh, great to to listen to you. Um, very insightful. I've uh, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Like I say, going back to that teenager that had your quote on the wall, um, to then having the the, the privilege of sharing the field with you but then most importantly as a as a teammate in um 
for for England and Great Britain. It was a a, a huge a huge honour to stand shoulder to shoulder with one of your childhood boyhood hero heroes. So um and here we are now having a conversation with you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. You're one of the, the great characters of, of our game and um again you did so much for for me probably in in terms of the the respect that you earned for the English players. Um you know, I think that you were the, the, the real catalyst for, you know, the Australian based clubs looking and taking seriously the English forwards especially. So um thank you for for, for, for doing that for me. And no, um, no, thanks for your kind words, Jamin. It's uh enjoyed the enjoyed the chat and it's nice, nice to know uh, uh these things, you know, uh yeah, you don't realise, you know, when when you're playing with you didn't realise I was uh, had a bit of a, a bit of an impact on your uh, early career. Mm, so if you were to say one person that's influenced, yeah. I don't put words in there. Oh, Brilliant. That, can you say me? <laughs> can, can I say can it? Say can it? I say yeah. it, Andrew Morley? Oh. Well, I'll say it. I've already said not to. Oh, said not to me. <laughs> Brilliant, Moss. Thanks for joining us here on the Bar Round. I hope all the listeners enjoyed this. I make no apologies for taking advantage of of our relationship and our love of the office. Thank you for listening. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.